Thanks very much, Dan. Thanks for having me back, guys. I really enjoyed uh, going through the drawing honor with you last time. And today what we're going to do, we're going to go through, um, as Dan just said, we're going to go through the painting um, honor. And it's interesting, um, drawing and painting, they're quite closely linked. They're quite closely linked, but there are some different skills that are involved in, in painting as opposed to drawing. I um, well, let me introduce myself first, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about how they're involved and, and how one can lead into the other. So, Ashley, uh, uh, do uh, just for a second. I'm going to mute everybody, and please unmute yourself just to make sure we have the best quality recording. So, once again, big thank you, everybody, uh, for for for, uh, for sticking with us this long. Ashley, are you uh, okay now? Just make sure you unmute yourself. Uh, did I give you? Uh, yeah, I, I think I. Uh, let me just see what's happening. Oh, Ashley, uh, ask. Uh, okay, ask to unmute. Here it is. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, I think I think I can unmute now. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Thumbs up. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, just a little introduction before uh, we get into it. Uh, so my name is Ashley. I'm. I work as an illustrator. Um, and photographer, I do a few things, but, um, but since I was young, I've also always done illustration. And I do illustration for things like books, sometimes children's books, magazines, um, but a lot of work for different ministries as well. Um, so I also sometimes teach digital illustration classes. And uh, I think my favorite thing to do is to illustrate things from the Bible and to help uh, make things from the Bible clearer through drawings, through illustrations. So, um, that's me. I work in a few different ways. So as well as um, working with traditional kind of pencil and paper and paint materials, I do a lot of my work digitally now. Um, but the work that I do digitally, I tend to do um, with kind of media that is, uh, that is a bit more similar to real paint, but just a little bit quicker. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that today as well. Um, and we're going to start today uh, as we go through the island. Does everyone have a worksheet? Hopefully you have a worksheet either printed off or available on the screen uh, because we're going to go through our worksheet and we're going to sort of divide uh, what we cover into a few areas today. And we're going to start off uh, by looking at colour, understanding colour. And this is a big part. When we talk about painting, uh, we don't just mean what you do with a brush and liquid paint. I think this on a pretty much will cover what you do with traditional painted media like oil and acrylic paints, but also the same techniques you could use if you're using digital or if you're using colored pencils or chalks or charcoals as well. Um, and the very first part of that is understanding the way that color works. So has anyone ever heard of a color wheel before? Just wave your hands if you've heard of a color wheel. Cool, a few of us. Uh, okay, so color wheel is basically a way to explain the way that color works. And we start off with something called primary colors. Now, if you guys are active in the chat, feel free to uh, type in the chat. Uh, I'd love to know, do you guys know what the primary colors are when it comes to painting? Any suggestions? What are those primary colors? I'll give you a hint, there's three of them. Yeah, you guys are switched on. All righty. Definitely. So. Yeah, 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 well done guys, well done. So yeah, I'm seeing a lot of red, yellow, and blue, and that's absolutely right. When we start off uh, with the primary colors in the color wheel, they are red, yellow, and blue. And the reason that we call them the primary colors is that they can be your starting point to get to all of the other colors. Um, so if, for example, you were starting to paint something and you only had three color paints available, I would recommend you choose red, yellow, and blue because you can mix them together and pretty much get any other colors with them. So they're the primary colors. If you do start mixing them together, you get what we call secondary colors. Now, do you guys know what the secondary colors are? All right. Yeah, let's put yeah, I'm, I'm not looking at the chat. Diane, you can, right. you can tell me what do we have the secondary yeah, yeah, no colors? Problem. Actually, I'll do that. Uh, we, I'm just giving a chance for a few people to uh, catch up. So what are secondary colors? Turquoise, green, orange, purple. Um, uh, I, I, I'm just reading what is there, Ashley, do not judge me. Sure. Uh, uh, somebody <laughs> says baby blue, uh, baby blue, 
uh, no, 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 uh, okay, okay, sorry about this. I'll, okay, a few, uh, somebody's saying I learned this in school. So actually, wow. you tell us. Okay, well, some of you guys had it right. Um, let's bring them in. So these are the secondary colors. Now, to really understand them, it helps if you look at the colors that are next to them. So the colors we already had were red, blue, and yellow. And the colors in between those are the secondary colors that you get when you mix the other two colors together. So for example, to mix yellow and blue together, that will give you green. To mix red and yellow together would give you orange. And to mix uh, purple and blue together would, sorry, <laughs> blue and red together would give you purple. Um, and this is something, you, you know how I do guys, if, you're, if you've been in the last session, I always like to, um, to actually show a practical demonstration. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring up a, um, a canvas for you here. Let me just bring that up on the screen. And I've got, like I said, I've got my uh, tablet sort of plugged into the screen. So I'm going to use that as an example. Um, but I'm just going to grab uh, some colors here. So I'm going to go first of all to my red. And oh, that's a bit dark. Let me make sure I'm in the right shade of red. There you go. So you can see when I start painting this red on the screen, we get this beautiful deep red. Um, let me bring in my yellow again. and get this beautiful yellow. That might be a bit too much on the orange side. So let me bring that up a little bit. And we'll bring in a blue. And you can see they're kind of clear on the page, but because this works like real paint, I can actually start blending them together. And what you'll see, as I actually start mixing them, the more I pick up of each color, the more it maybe lightens or darkens it. But this is how we're making our secondary colors. So as I mix that blue and red together, I get purple. If I get more blue into it, that goes to a deeper purple. But that's how that kind of mixing process takes place. So think about that when you're actually painting, think about how those colors are gonna to mix together. This color theory really, really helps to understand what you're going to be doing. So those are our secondary colors. Hopefully that makes sense, guys. Cool. Well, let's have a look after that. So once we've got our secondary colors, the last thing we've got is what we call tertiary colors. It's basically the third set of colors. And these ones, they're pretty simple. They just basically mean you either have a more blue version of that purple or you have a more red version of the purple, which goes towards a pink, or like we said, a more golden version of that orange that looks like yellow. And so you can see the more you mix of each of the primary colors into a secondary color, the more you can actually make uh, those different shades. Cool, so this is how we pretty much get most of the colors that we'd need. Uh, something else worth knowing about though is the relationship these colors have to each other. And this is something that's quite cool about understanding painting. The more you start to understand paint, you understand the way that our minds interpret colors that we see. And there's certain relationships different colors have with each other that are really kind of uh, what we call complementary colors. And so I'm going to go back to our simple secondary colors for a second. When we say complementary colors, does anyone know what that means? Complementary colors, have yeah, you guys heard that? Right there, guys, are you able to type that in the chat to the comment section? And also, if you like this presentation, don't forget to like, hit the like button and share it. Thank you. So what is the, what is the, what is the complementary? What is complementary colors? Yeah, colors. I have a feeling actually that we we might not get that answer. You might need some. That's all right. That's what I'm here for. So, yeah. What you complement? Can... What complementary colors are is colors that kind of contrast a little bit with each other and bring out the best of another color. They make the other color look good. It's like getting a compliment. Compliments a good thing. Um, and complementary colors work this way. The color. If you look at a color wheel. The color that lies opposite that color will be a complementary color. So for example, if I look at yellow, what color on the color wheel is it yellow? Well, it's purple. It's the color that's made up from the other two primary colors. And the point is that when you put those two colors together, it works really well. They're the colors that look really good when they go together. So for example, the complementary color of red what happens when you mix the other two primary colors together, you get green. So green and red actually go quite well together, which we know because when we see all the Christmas decorations, they use those two colors, don't they? Red and green together. Um, you see some sports teams will always use complementary colors because they go really well together. 
but it's something if you want a really bold engaging design that looks good it's a good idea to try and use some complementary colors next to each other they tend to work well cool now i saw someone in the chat say something really clever actually which was is it possible to make black and white i'm so glad you brought that up so black and white are slightly different to our primary secondary and tertiary colors they're what we call neutral colors they don't lean sort of one way or another now the interesting thing is mixing colors together is something that isn't just in painting you see it in other places like in science in physics it's interesting what happens when you mix different color lights together so if you mix all the different colors of light you end up getting white light which is slightly different to paint because if you mix all the different colors of paint together it won't end up white it will end up very dirty sort of brownish but um but with light you mix all those colors of light together you get white and you take all the colors of light away and you get darkness and blackness um with paint these colors white and black are separate they're kind of neutral colors but they do have an effect if you mix them with other colors so if you mix white and black with other colors on the color wheel um you get what are called shades and tints. Now, firstly, before we get to that, what happens if you mix white and black together? Type it in the chat, guys. Let's hear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And what's happening when you mix these two? Oh, somebody says you get gray. You absolutely do, yeah. You get gray, you get gray, dude. I like that. Excellent. <laughs> yes, you do get gray. Um, so yeah, that's what happens when you mix them. But when you mix either of those with other colors on the color wheel, then you get, firstly, when you mix white, you get something called tint. And a tint is something that is has a whiter cast, but it's sort of like a hint of that color. It's almost like a more pastel-y version of that color. So for example, if you're wanting to uh, paint a scene and maybe you wanted to paint um, something in the background, something that's not as close up, but maybe looks like it's a landscape, it's further away, it's a foggy day, and you want the tree to be green, but you don't want it to be a bright green. You want it to look further away. You could use a tint for that. So you can mix a little bit of white and that would get you a lighter green that would look more like it's hidden by fog. Does that make sense, guys? Awesome, awesome, okay. Um, we've also got our shades and shades, exactly the same thing as tints, except it's with blacks. And you can see what it does. It obviously it makes that color a bit darker, but it will give a little bit of muddiness that color it will the way that paint works it's it's probably not the cleanest way to get a darker version of the color so for example if you want a darker green rather than adding black to it i would probably add blue to bring that green down but still make it vibrant but if you wanted a bit of a muddier green if you wanted a green that was really like a drizzly autumn day then that's where i'd probably put a little bit of black in and that would get it a little bit muddier and uh, it will give you that more subdued green okay hopefully that makes sense we all good with that, guys? Okay, fantastic. Well, with that in mind, guys, I love doing some talking, um, but we are gonna get into a little bit of a hands-on. So uh, there's one more thing to talk about before we get hands-on, but I just wanna give you a heads up. So if you haven't got it already, just grab a piece of paper, grab, if you have um, some paints, some, you know, I don't want you to make a mess, but you know, some paints to hand if you do have them, uh, get ready with those or if you've just got coloring pencils or chalks or crayons, get those ready as well and also if you've got the guide printed out that would be amazing if not just a piece of paper to draw on would be great because uh, we're going to get that ready soon before we get there though there's one other thing i want to talk to you about around color which is something called a value scale and uh, if you were on the drawing session we actually talked about this a little bit with pencil drawings as well when we talked about uh, a value scale with pencil drawings, we were talking about the value, meaning how light or how dark something was. Now you can also have a value scale in color of color being light or dark, but there's also the type of value that refers to the, the mood that that color set, the feel that that color set. And one thing to be aware of when you're talking about a value scale is whether a color is what we call a warm color or a cool color. And uh, if you look at the same color wheel that we've got here, you could pretty much divide that into half and find your warm colors on one side and your cool colors on the other side. Now, how do we know if a color is warm or cool? Well, the simple answer is it makes you feel warm or cool. And uh, I just want you to visualize for yourself. I've got two pictures 
up here on on the slide of a bedroom each one is a bedroom and without knowing how high the radiators were you've got to admit if you looked at that bedroom on the left hand side with the yellow bed and the yellow curtains that just looks like a warm room doesn't it that looks pretty toasty and warm. you'd like to stay there in the winter right weirdly if you look at the other side the the other side of the room which is blue and white and much more cool colors that looks and feels cool even though we have no idea what the temperature is like in either of those rooms, right? And it's because those colors actually generate that feeling of warm or cool. And that's very useful to know as an artist because it means if you want your, if you're trying to draw like a painting of someone in the snow, you know that you wanna keep away from those yellow colors. You wanna stick more towards those blues and those greens and those cooler colors. If you want someone something to feel like it's in a warm place and use those warm colors, but not only that, if you want to create a certain mood, so a warm mood is quite nice, quite comforting, makes you feel good. And you can make your paintings have that kind of feel by using warmer colors for that as well. Now we're getting a bit kind of metaphysical here, but hopefully that makes sense, guys. So do you know what we see as warm colors and cool colors? Anything towards the yellow sides, yellows, oranges, light greens would be warm. And then the cooler side would be blues, those darker greens, those uh, light purples. Cool. Now I've said that, it's great to see how that really works in a real painting. So this is a painting I really like. You may have seen it, a really famous painting, Ali uh, by the Lake. And it's interesting because the painter here has used warm and cool colors in the same painting. And it looks like a real scene, doesn't it? But what's really interesting is that it's definitely got a mood. It feels pretty warm by those street lights, doesn't it? He's used those whites, those oranges, and that feels like the warm side of the picture. Uh, but you go over towards the lake, and that feels like a really cool scene. You want to, you don't really want to be falling in that lake. It looks terrible, doesn't it? Super cool. But the interesting thing about this is that he's actually used those colors, and it looks like a realistic scene. But what's funny about this is what color are leaves usually? Just type in the chat, what color would leaves on trees usually be? We have a question, guys. Yeah, yeah. What color would you usually expect the leaves on the trees to be? Yeah. Green. I like it, Jimmy. Yeah, absolutely. Leaves on the trees, you'd expect them to be green, right? I mean, if it's autumn, maybe differently. But yeah, usually you'd expect those leaves to be green. The artist has actually painted them as yellow, bright yellow. That's usually the color you'd use for like a flame or something, right? But because it kind of works, because it fits the mood, because that's the color that the lights would generate, it actually looks natural. Um, and again, the other side of the painting looks just as natural, even though he's used a bright blue for it. So it's a great painting, but it shows you what's possible when you really understand colour theory. Okay. Is everyone still cool? We're, our heads haven't exploded yet. Okay. Because yeah, we've, been, we've been on for a little while now, so you guys are doing well. Um, so I think it's time to get a little bit hands on. Um, have you guys, hopefully you guys have all got worksheets. Um, we. I'm hoping you had a chance to print out the worksheet if you got it on a physical piece of paper, because there is something on that worksheet, which is an illustration uh, that I've actually uh, drawn. And I'm going to go to our illustration. So this is the illustration. This is, um, it, as I said, done digitally. Now, if I take away the painting layer, your illustration probably looks a little bit like this. You've got just a line drawing. Have, have you guys got that? Have you got the worksheet? Awesome. Great. So if you've got your um, color pencils, we're going to start filling this in. But what we're not going to do is we're not just going to fill it in with the regular skin tones and hair tones that we'd expect. We're going to do that, but we're also going to try and bring in um, some of those colors that we talked about. So to do this, I'm going to clear off that painting layer I've already got, and I'm going to draw on an empty layer. If you've got the worksheet in front of you, then uh, what I would do is just get some colored pencils. And I think first thing we're going to do is we're going to try and introduce some shadows to this scene. Now, shadows usually happen in the cooler areas when you're trying to draw shadows. Oh, sorry. Because shadows are cooler. Let me bring that back. There we go. Because our shadows are cooler, um, they're going to usually look a bit more on the blue side with our blue colors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually start painting in shadows first 
and then I'm going to add my skin tones on top of this. Now, if you're using paint, what I'd recommend is getting a blue paint or if you're using colored pencils, using a blue pencil and just starting to fill in the shadow. So I'm going to get a blue. Well, it's not going to be too bright a blue, a bit of a grayish blue. But I'm actually going to get a brush and I'm just going to start coloring in the areas of my painting that would be in shadow. And at first, this is going to look really strange because not many people have bright blue faces, but trust me, it's going to make sense. So we're just going to fill this in. Now, this is something some people ask all the time, how do you know where to put the shadows? <laughs> and it's a good question. Uh, the short answer is practice and observation. <laughs> and I won't lie to you guys, if you want to get really good as an artist, it's going to take a lot of practice. It's going to take a lot of, um, you know, trying things out and they not having them go right the first time. Um, but the more you practice, the better you get at it. But the other thing is also observation, also looking at objects around you. So for example, I'm filling in where the shadows would go on this painting. And I'm not worrying about the color that everything would be in the real world. I'm literally just filling in with blue, the areas where I put the shadows. So if you guys do the same thing, just think of where the shadows would go. And generally the rule as well, if you're not sure where they would go, think about if the light is coming from one direction. So my light in my picture is all coming from uh, the right side of the picture and it's kind of falling onto the face of uh, this lady here. And areas where the shadow wouldn't reach is things that are gonna be obstructed. So things like the, the top of her neck here, the shadow would go there because the light wouldn't hit that part of the neck. If you look at most people, you'll see there's a shadow underneath their neck because the light doesn't reach there. Also because of the shape of the face, you'd usually see some shadows just underneath the eyebrows because you've got eye sockets that sort of keep some of the light away there. And then also we'll probably see a few shadows sort of in these areas as well, where the sort of head obstructs the hair from seeing the light. And by the way, as I'm drawing, Dayan, if you had any questions, if you guys have any questions in the chat, um, yep. feel free to. Uh, we are all uh, watching and enjoying it. Uh, so, like, uh, uh, like Ashley said, if you do have any questions, please do post it in the chat section, uh, and also on the Facebook comment section. So, uh, we can. Uh, well, maybe you don't know this, but Ashley, Ashley, I don't know if she's still doing it, but Ashley used to do massive demonstrations uh, like this in he, in the Apple Store in London uh, on a huge screen. I don't think I have a so big a screen at that, Ashley. Are you still doing that or you are in different area at the moment? Not for a little while, yeah. Unfortunately, the lockdown has sort of uh, stopped the usual running of things. But uh, yeah, still, whenever I can, I like to teach. Very um, good. Just individuals, yeah. I have okay, so, people comment. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Ashley is uh, amazing uh, on what we replied. He is the best. Uh, we truly uh, love the, uh, your way of teaching as well. Uh, some people uh, get a little bit panicky, uh, but uh, uh, you uh, seem to be, be uh, amazing when it comes to uh, teaching oh, time and explaining, yeah. It's a very nice group. <laughs> I like you guys. I may have to come. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So let's have a look at what we've got. We've got where our shadows would naturally fall, and we've done that with a little bit of a blue um, tint. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, now I'm going to do this digitally. But if you're doing this physically, then the easiest way is you can actually probably paint over. Now, depending which paint you're using, if you're using something like watercolor, which dries quickly, you probably only need to wait a, you know, a minute or two before you do this. If you're using something like acrylic or oil paint, which dries very slowly, you may actually want to leave this a little bit of time before you do it. Um, but I'm going to do the equivalent of actually painting over to the top of this. Now, uh, because this is digital, I'm going to do it in a very digital kind of way, um, which is instead of painting over, I'm just going to lower the opacity so you can see what it would look like if I were to paint over the top. But then I'm going to bring in the regular skin tone 
and something amazing happens here. So I'm just, with this lady's face, going to paint on the regular skin tone. And you can see what happens, which is really interesting, is the paint actually gets darker and cooler because of the blue. This is the usual color of the paint. I haven't changed the color here. See where I go over the area that was blue, you get this kind of shadow effect. Now, this is exactly what would happen if you did the same thing with things like oil or acrylic paint. And I'm going to do this fairly quickly. And obviously, we'd spend a lot more time on this. If I didn't have more time, but you can see the way that blue interacts, it actually gives me this kind of shadow effect on the face. And again, the equivalent, if I was doing this with, um, with real paint, if I wanted to, I could kind of layer the paint on a bit more thickly, and that would sort of make my shadows go down a little bit. But you'd essentially get the same effect that those blue colors that I've added underneath are going to add a really nice natural looking shadow. And that's something called underpainting. And you use this a lot with um, this technique a lot, like a lot of the famous artists, the masterpieces, you know, that you see the Rembrandts and the Van Goghs and stuff will do this. They paint underneath with a kind of bluer color to show the shadows. And then that would give you this sort of shadow effect. Now, once you've done that, you can actually start blending your shadows a bit more. So you can use kind of lighter strokes to just lightly blend your shadows. You can literally use a blending tool and just kind of mix your shadows up. Like so, this is literally equivalently just smudging those shadows to make them look quite natural. What's really cool about this though is how this actually interacts with all the colors. So that skin tone looks a bit darker, as you can see. But we've also got, if I was to paint on some lighter colors, maybe for where the eyes go or the lips go, you can see that this interacts the same way. You get this really nice natural shadow under the eyes like so. And if I get a color for the lips, maybe, same thing, that shadow that I've introduced on the lips makes the lips look like they have this really natural shadow going on. So you can see this is a really cool technique to make these shadows in my picture look a lot more natural is that I've done this underpainting with blue to make it look cooler. All right, any, any other questions in the chat there? Is that all making sense to everyone? Uh, no, people are just watching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm just cool. blown now, away by your drawing skills, Ashley. That's so, cool. Somebody just said slightly jealous <laughs> people. <laughs> okay, cool. Now, the, the, the last sort of element of this, once we've got those shadows in, that does look like real shadows on the face, doesn't it? Um, but the same is true of those warmer colors. So, you know, if someone's got their face turned away from the light, um, I've kind of got it here. I've got a lamp next to me. If I turn this lamp off, you can see my face looks different. When I turn the lamp back on, I get this nice yellow glow on my face. And you can replicate that the same way. So the same way we had a shadow layer, we can have a, uh, a highlight layer as well, which we're going to get by getting a really nice yellow kind of color here. So this yellow color, I'm going to do exactly the same thing I did with my shadows and make it a little bit more transparent. But I can just paint those highlights onto my drawing. You can see that really kind of adds this nice edge to the face as well. And you can see it just looks a lot more natural introducing those really, really light yellow colors onto the skin here. And uh, just think of everywhere on the drawing where we'd see those yellow colors introduced. So just a little tip, guys. And uh, obviously we're doing this really quickly because we've only got an hour together, but try this out. After this, you're gonna obviously get some tasks that we have to kind of complete. 
Um, but one thing to think of when you're doing the painting uh, for this work is think about how those cooler colors like blue or those warmer colors like yellow can be used to really add highlights or shadows to your drawings and your paintings and making them cooler and, um, and warmer. So yeah, very, very quick demo. We, I probably am gonna try and finish this off later on, but I think let's get back to the class. Cool. Any other questions on that, guys? Just type them in the chat. And, uh, oh, we we have a we have a, a people sending us photos of how the families are painting and drawing at the moment. Oh, really? That oh, is that's beautiful. awesome. <laughs> that's beautiful. Actually, if in case you need a little bit of more time for Ashley, we can find more time. So uh, this is the last honor. So everybody who has to go, they will go. But but if you need a little bit more time, don't don't get stressed about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think as well with the paintings, if you are painting along with me. Don't worry about getting everything finished now. That's that's not the point. We just want to really kind of learn now. But you guys have the rest of the day um, if you want to carry on. Somebody did ask, uh, uh, Ashley, do you actually have uh, uh, online classes, Ashley? Uh, good question. Not yet. Um, it's something that I would like to do in the near future. So I'm going to, as soon as if and when that does happen, I'm going to let Dan know. Doesn't know Ashley. <laughs> different jobs at the same time. So I, I was actually surprised that you don't teach online already. But uh, Ashley does a lot of illustration for many books. So yeah, uh, if you get if you get started that, let us know and we'll make sure we publish it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, as Dan said, I'm afraid I stayed pretty busy. So I'm working on a couple of children's books at the moment. But um, when they're out, I was also still there. Cool. All right. Let's have a look at the next step. We've talked about color um quite a bit and did that thing that we obviously started doing but color is one aspect and it's, it's a very important aspect to understand the next aspect though is understanding materials and when i say materials i mean everything that you use paint or other materials to actually do these illustrations or piece of paintings and so uh let's let's have a little mini quiz guys i would love you to type in the chat or write on your worksheets uh if you can, seven, I'd be very impressed if someone manages to do seven, but feel free to drop them one by one in the chat. Types of materials which make up color media. So. All right, that's a question for all of us. Yeah, I put in the chat, wherever you are, guys. Let's see what you guys come up with. Any color media. Somebody's mentioning water painting. Yeah, water painting, so I'd say watercolor. Um, painting, yeah, definitely. Uh, we're gonna. Uh, uh, Facebook is about nine seconds behind, so we'll wait for that. Any other answers? All right, uh, charcoal. Charcoal, potentially, yeah, you can get colored charcoals. Usually, charcoal you'd use in black and white, but you can get colored charcoal. So yeah, good. Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but people are talking about digital forms. Yeah, digital. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've been using it for the last few minutes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Digital is a thing are still telling you to start online teaching classes uh <laughs> normal uh, paintbrush yes yeah, sure. so paint I, I'm, I'm gonna um, bring in yeah paints so there's paints we talked about watercolor paint but other types of paint i think other people have uh, mentioned a few so we talked about watercolor but we've also got as some people have said acrylic paint oil paint or pastel fantastic has, has anyone got to seven yet there's that doesn't look like, but yeah. I don't know how should I should I give you a few answers? Yeah, yeah please do, please do. Excellent. So some of these you'll have heard of, some of these maybe not. Um, but when we talk about paints, you've got oil paints, acrylic paints, watercolor paints, tempera paints, crayon, colored pencil, oil pastel, chalk pastel, inks, gouache, and digital media. They're not the only ones, but they're probably the most common ones that you hear about. Um, but yeah, there can be loads. In fact, ones that I haven't put there, things like markers, you know, um, watercolor markers, I guess they go more into drawing. But yeah, all of these would rank as colored media. We're gonna throw in a spray paint. Yeah, amazing. I didn't even write that down, but spray paint, really good suggestion. So um, there's a couple of questions here. We're going to get a bit more into the technical thing, but it's really good stuff to know. So out of all those materials, there are some differences between them. Obviously, you have the solid materials like chalks and pastels. 
And by the way, if anyone's never tried oil pastel before, that used to be my favorite material to draw in, oil pastel. I love the finish you can get with that. Um, but you've got those physical ones and then you've got the liquid materials, so things like paints. And uh, when we talk about paints, there's different types of paints. And, you know, we mentioned watercolor and acrylic. They basically go into two categories, which is water-based and oil-based paints. So out of that list we just had, does anyone, can anyone think of oil-based paints? All righty, oil-based paints. Uh, actually, uh, maybe the best thing at the moment is give us those answers. Yeah. Uh, and, and we'll then call the them. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. So water-based paints would be things like watercolors, acrylic, and tempera. And the basic thing about that is the thing that makes up that paint is it's based in water. So meaning if you were making, you know, some acrylic paint, the way you would make it is you would get some water and you would mix in some acrylic powder, mix them together and you get acrylic paint. So it's based in water. Um, whereas oil paints are similar, same kind of pigments and powder, but mixed with oil. Now, each of those have different advantages, uh, but they also have disadvantages. So one of the advantages with oil-based paint, if you think of oil, oil can take longer to dry and oil paints can take a long time to dry, which uh, is not great if you're trying to clean them, but can be really good if you're trying to paint a picture because it means you can paint something, you can come back the next day and your paint will still be wet enough for you to work with. Whereas acrylic paints or water paints you can paint with, and then a few minutes later they'll have dried already. So sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Um, but it means when we're cleaning up after kind of oil paints, uh, we tend to use different materials to clean them as well. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, little pop quiz, I will let you guys try and answer this one, is there's a type of paint that was made with egg yolk. So this is a complete trivia question. Does anyone know the type of paint made with egg yolk? And this goes out, I think, to the older people as well, the adults. I'd be interested if you know. Oh, uh, wow. Wow, wow. Uh, that <laughs> might be a little bit hard. I'm now calling to all of you. <laughs> all the adults. I want all your answer. That's right, to help us. Uh, <laughs> You need to know actually a lot of other Pathfinder directors are watching as well from Scotland, Wales, well, no Wales. Wales has actually Pathfinder Day today, but we have Scotland SEC watching, so maybe they know as well. I, I see egg paint in the chat. That's a good guess. It's an egg paint. Somebody said yellow. Someone said yellow. These, these, are, these are thinking answers. I see where you're coming from, guys. Um, it's actually a type of paint called tempura. And this is not tempura, as in the takeaway food, which is deep fried vegetables, no. This is tempura with an E, which is a type of paint that is made uh, with uh, egg, egg yolk as a base. And it's really interesting. The reason we mention this is because before oil paint was discovered in about the 1500s, this is the paint that people used for, for hundreds of years. In fact, this type of painting goes back really, really far but the crazy thing about tempera paint is it lasts super long. In fact, if when museums and galleries are open again, if you go to the National Gallery, you can see paintings there from about the 1100s, 1200s that still show up really well today. They were literally painted, you know, more than a thousand years ago and they still look pretty amazing because that egg material works as an amazing base. So do, do check it out if, uh, if when museums get open again in galleries, go to the National Gallery and have a look at some of those tempera paintings. Cool. Now, let's talk about physical materials because I do have um, some physical materials, even though I do a lot of my work digitally now. Um, we also do still use traditional paint brushes and traditional paints. So here are some of my brushes. And um, you can see on the screen, there are different types of brushes. They go into different categories. And even if you don't use traditional materials, if you use digital materials, it's still helpful to know this because you're going to use the same digital brushes as these traditional brushes. And so you have different types. You have a round brush. Now, a round brush is probably the most versatile. You can use round brushes for all sorts of work. You can use them for doing big background work, you can use them for filling in uh, smaller areas, or you can use them for adding highlights. Uh, then you've got flat brushes, and flat brushes like this um, are obviously they're really thick on one side, they're really thin on the side view. And so these are quite good for filling in large areas, things like sky or, or you know, those background areas of a painting. 
um, but also good if you, if you do like things like calligraphy because they're flat you can twist the brush and get really nice calligraphy uh, with them as well. Then you've got I think my personal favorite which is liner brushes these are very thin brushes and uh, these are my favorite because most painters will tell you the most fun part of a painting is the details. That's the really fun part. That's the part you always want to skip ahead to, but you, you're not allowed to skip ahead. But when you get into those detail areas, uh, they're really fine um, brushes that help you do things like eyelashes and you know, very, very fine details. And then you have, I don't have one with me, but there's one on the screen, a fan brush. And a fan brush, again, really great for those backgrounds, but you can also use it if you use your hand in a different way to splash it around, you can use it to add things like clouds, really sort of uh, parchment-like details. And also mop brushes. Mop brushes can be great if you're doing something not so realistic, a bit more abstract, and you want big areas of color, um, you can use all of those um, different types of brushes for those purposes. So hopefully you caught some of that. I know it's on your worksheets sort of to fill in what those brushes are used for. Um, so that's a little overview for what you can use them for. And when you're using these brushes, uh, this doesn't really apply to the digital, but definitely to the physical brushes, it's important to know how you actually care for them. Um, because I'm sure you've experienced this at school, if you're doing a painting project at school, if you paint and then just leave the brush on the side, it's going to get clogged up with paint. And then maybe after one time you use it, that paintbrush will be useless. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure you can keep using your paints. Uh, brushes over and over again. So the thing I'd really recommend is if it's water-based paint that we talked about before, just use water, run the brush under a tap and keep running it under until the water runs clear and uh, it, all the paint has come off there. Or if you're using oil brushes, you can use another material called turpentine um, or other similar materials, which actually gets rid of oil and that cleans the brush. But the most important thing is when you clean a brush, you wanna make sure that if you then brush that brush on a piece of newspaper or something, that the colour doesn't come out, that you've completely cleaned it. And the reason you do that is because if you don't clean the brushes and the paint dries on the brush, it will be useless. You won't be able to use it again. So uh, it's a really, really important part of the process to clean brushes. Okay, cool. I think we're doing well. We're not too bad for time. So that's all about our materials. Again, if you have any more questions on Facebook or on the chat, just type them in and uh, they can read them out as we go along but we'll go straight to our next part of the process, which is subjects. Now, what do we mean by subjects? Well, subjects, we mean what we're painting and also the way we're painting as well, the style of our painting. Um, so there's two different types of uh, painting that I wanna highlight, um, which is realistic and abstract. And again, could you throw in the chat, what does realistic mean? And what does abstract mean? A question for all of us again. Uh, what is what is realistic and what is abstract? Uh, um, maybe uh, we will get some answers right now, but you never know, Ashley. Uh, okay, uh, it's taking a little bit of time. And yeah, I think we're coming in. Yeah. So what is realistic? Do we have any answers for something that okay, is- Realistic means uh, real. Yeah. <laughs> The clues in the name, I guess, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Realistic paintings, something that looks real, something that looks, yeah. It's a style of painting where you intentionally try and paint something to look like it does in, in the real world. And um, this is something, I guess a few of us might struggle on. This is something I always was trying to do. I love to try and paint something to look as close to the real thing as possible. Um, Abstract, any answers for our abstract means? I, I, uh, yeah, let me have a look. Abstract is like you're trying to make lines mean something. Oh, I like that, that's, uh, that's quite cool. So yeah, maybe, I guess the best way of thinking of it is kind of the opposite to realistic art. It's where you're not so concerned about something looking exactly like the object it is. Some types of abstract art, it's about the way things can make you feel, you know, the colors that are associated with certain feelings. Sometimes it's about, you know, not maybe showing something looking the way it is, but really getting the essence of something in another way. So there's a type of painting called cubist painting, which can be hard to wrap your head around, but the idea with that is it's pretty abstract, but what it's trying to do is it's trying to show all the sides of an object at the same time. 
So if I had, for example, if I had a box of cereal and I was painting in a cubist way, it's really hard to figure out, but on a flat piece of paper, I'm going to paint almost all the sides of that box of cereal at the same time. Now it's not gonna look like a box of cereal, but I'm sort of showing all the different aspects of it. So abstract stuff can be really interesting, uh, are not necessarily looking exactly like your subject, but maybe telling you something else about it. Uh, I think we've got another comment, which is abstract is using visual language. I like that. I'm not 100% sure even what it means, but it sounds very intelligent. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, cool, let's have a look at some examples. So realistic art and abstract art. We've got the same subject matter here, which is some, you know, some jugs and glasses and things like that. But one is painted in the realistic style, one is painted in the abstract style. Now this one on the left is, is almost what we call hyper-realistic, which means it's, it's so realistic, you almost think it's the photo, right? And uh, some of my favorite pieces of ultra-realistic, hyper-realistic art, I genuinely can't tell they're not photos. They're, they're so good. They take a long time to do that. I will say that they take a lot of dedication. But that's a really amazing painting. If you are interested in making more realistic art, obviously, like we said, it takes a lot of practice. Um, but what they've done in the drawing on the left, there is a little tip in that. Something that can make things look more realistic is choosing what you paint. Things like metal and glass, which have reflections, it's a little bit easier to paint them looking very realistic because when you see the reflections, it, it, it looks a little bit more real than something like skin tones. Skin can be quite hard. People can be quite hard to make look happy realistic without spending a lot of time on that. So choosing your subject can help if you're going for realism. Um, and abstract art, you know, this is interesting because we can tell it's bottles and jars and things, but they haven't painted it in 3D at all. They've just used flat colors and then they've kind of mixed the shapes together and made this thing. But some people really prefer that style. Some people might say, actually, if I wanted something to look like a photo, I'd just take a photo. Maybe I want something abstract to show a bit more expression. So there is no right or wrong answer, but, um, but there are two pretty cool examples of that work. Okay, now moving on, as well as the styles that you draw them in, uh, you've also got different subjects in terms of what you choose to draw. So, um, for example, we have portraits would be a type of subject. Um, there are some other subjects as well. I'll give you four examples, portraits, landscapes, still life, and abstract. Now, if anyone was on the drawing, session we actually already talked about this in the drawing session as well so hopefully you guys can already remember what we mean by portraits um i don't want to overdo you in the chat but i'll, I'll do maybe just this one last time uh can anyone type in the chat what is a portrait let's see anyone tell me what's a portrait oh no actually at the moment nobody's saying anything I think they're thinking about their dinner. Uh, uh, it says somebody says drawing a face, sketch okay, of a face. Okay, okay. They're, they're coming in now. They're yes, coming in yes, now. Yes. And by by the way, guys, just a heads up. I'm going to ask you the same thing with the others. So get ready. So, but you got the right idea. A portrait is a drawing of a person. It's you know getting a person in your painting. Um, I suppose it could also be an animal. Some people, there's a lot of arguments over this whether animals count as a portrait. I would say they could count as a portrait. Um, but yes, an artistic representation of a person. Very, very good dictionary definition there. Thank you, Samuel. Um, landscapes, what is a landscape? Type it in, guys. What do you think a landscape is? I'm making a bit more time with this one. Yeah, yeah. Can anyone think what a landscape is? Landscape is a large area, mm. painted picture of a land. Yeah. So, yeah, basically, a landscape is a picture of a scene. It's a picture of an environment. So instead of focusing on a person or even an animal, it's focusing on an environment and that could be outside that I suppose that could be buildings as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of the other side of the spectrum to a portrait. Now, I, I won't quiz you on all of these, but uh, let's go to a still life. So a still life 
is basically where you have the subject, but it's not alive, it's not moving. It's something that you can arrange. And uh, we're gonna do a little bit of still life later, but it's something that you can arrange and set up yourself. And lastly, we already talked a little bit about this, but abstract, we talked about realistic versus abstract. Abstract is basically a painting where there isn't a definite subject meant to look like the subject, but it's being a bit more figurative. So there's some very famous examples of all of these types of paintings. Probably the most famous portrait in the world, you guys may have seen it before, it's a painting by my favourite artist, Leonardo da Vinci, called the Mona Lisa. That's a very typical portrait. Uh, you've got landscapes, many great landscape painters out there. This one is a bridge done by a French painter called Monet. Still life, you may have seen this as well. You can see an example of this again in the National Gallery. The plant picture is uh, by an artist called Vincent van Gogh. And he's a Dutch artist. And uh, yeah, he painted this very famous picture of sunflowers. And uh, I'm tempted to ask the adults who painted the last picture. I'm not sure anyone knows, maybe they do. <laughs> this is a pretty famous painting uh, by Kandinsky, which is pretty abstract, you have to agree. It seems to be a collection of lines and shapes and forms. Um, but yeah, these are, these are some examples of each of those types of paintings. We're getting lots of Picassos coming in. Picasso, really good guess, guys. I was going to do Picasso, but Picasso, I thought, might not even be abstract enough. So this isn't uh, Picasso. Uh, this is uh, by an artist called Kandinsky. Uh, but very good guesses, though. It's, there's some elements that are like Picasso's. Very, very well done for knowing what Picasso's might look like. Okay. Cool, guys. I think we've done a lot. I think uh, there's been a lot of learning, but I think it's time to get hands on again. Are you guys ready for a little bit of a little yeah. bit of more hands on work? That very much so, Ashley. Thank you. Okay, well let's let's get into it, and I will join you in this as well. What I would love you to do is I would like you to draw and paint in your choice of color media a still life or a floral subject. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well. A still life, do you remember what we said? It's something that is arranged. It's not a living thing. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to move. Um, but you can actually paint it from observation. And when we say it can be a uh, subject, still life or floral subject, that means you can either have something inanimate, like, I don't know, I could use my keyboard or mouse or um, I think what I'm going to do, I quite like these paintbrushes that I was using before, so I might do a little painting with these paintbrushes. Um, or a floral subject. I do actually happen to have a, uh, a vase of flowers here, my orchids that sit by my desk. So I might paint these as well. So I think I'm going to do that. And one thing I'm going to do, you can see actually I'm going to put these flowers near my lamp and actually have my lamp uh, helping out because it's good to control your light source when you're painting, because it means you can choose to add those, those highlights or those shadows that we talked about before. So uh, do you guys wanna take a few seconds? Uh, hopefully you might already have something nearby, but if you don't, just grab something nearby you. Maybe it's a plant pot like me, maybe it's another set of objects. Try and choose something that's interesting to draw though. So, you know, I could, I suppose that if I had like a, a golf ball, I could draw that but it's just a little round white ball. So it's not as interesting as something like a flower, which has different kind of forms going on. So try and choose something. And then if you've got a blank piece of paper, um, try and uh, just get your piece of paper. If you're working with colored pencils, you can work with those. If you're working with watercolor or acrylic paints, just set that up. And uh, we're gonna take uh, just 10 minutes um, to start off our drawing. So I'm going to, uh, get back into my initial drawing and I'm going to bring it up on the screen as well. So there we go, back to our iPad. Now I'm going to try and talk through uh, what I'm doing as I'm doing it so it's easy for you guys to follow as well and so it's not just watching me getting really bored but please do try doing your own drawings at the same time and uh, yeah if any other questions come in on the chat um, Dan, if you can just let me know. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll so, do that. Also, just to remind everybody, if you decide to uh, draw, uh, as Ashley just 
post-its for the action number two. Uh, please do send us uh, the picture. Uh, we would love to share that with everybody else on the, on the Facebook as well. So the email address we'll be using is the, the one that's usually used. That's dan and adventist.uk. Please do send us. We publish all the work and all the arts and crafts on, on the Wednesdays. Uh, so try to have your pictures by Tuesday evening, if that's okay, guys. Yeah, uh, actually, <laughs> big thank you for your time. This is this was really educational for all of us, and we really enjoyed uh, your your techniques. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, guys. So yeah, please, uh, exactly as Dan said, yeah, do do share the artworks with us. I'd really love to see uh, what you guys have got up to, and. Uh, as you may have guessed, there's going to be some other tasks to follow. So we'll do what we can in the session, but it's only a short session. So um, using the techniques that we've talked about, I have a couple of tasks that I'd love you guys to do and maybe just send me when you're done. So just talking about what we have here, I'm drawing pretty much what I can see in front of me, which is this flower. I'm going to focus in. I'm not going to try and draw every single flower because to be honest, that would take too long <laughs> and we don't have that time. So I'm going to start off by just drawing in pencil. And you can see these are really rough outlines of these flowers. Now, I'm gonna try and make it as more the kind of realistic side as in this is what's in front of me, but I'm also going to, um, and I can do this because it's a painting, not a photo. I'm gonna take a few liberties. I'm gonna change some things, which I can do because I'm the painter. So if I want to change things, I can. And the thing I'm going to change is I'm going to change the colour of the flowers because they're just white at the moment, which is fine. But I think I can have a lot more fun if I change the colour. So um, I'm willing to take suggestions. What, what, what's everyone's favourite colour? What, uh, what would you guys like to see in terms of a, uh, a colour for the flowers? So I see, did I see blue? Suggestions, oh, yeah. green, yellow, blue, cool. orange and yellow. I don't even know if there are blue orchids. I, I think orange and yellow we have, but I might, we'll see what we can do actually. So I'm going to go orange and yellow. I quite like that. Um, so but before I start painting the flowers, and this is quite an important part, is before you do start um, a painting, you're going to want to make sure that you, um, that you uh, do the painting in the right order, especially depending what type of uh, material you're using. Because if you're using something like um, something like watercolor, the way watercolor works, if you paint something really dark and then try and paint over it in a light color, it won't show up. So you want to think about your sort of background colors first. So I'm going to choose a really light kind of background color, and I'm going to choose a little paintbrush. Oops, sorry, loads of messages coming. I'm going to choose a little paintbrush here, and. I'm just going to bring in a really light color, light blue from my background here. And you can see I'm using a type of paint that's quite similar to how acrylic paint would work. And I'm just filling that in like so. And again, I'm going with the lighter colors first because I want to make sure that I can sort of see what I'm doing. afterwards. Now, once I've got the background colour in, I'm going to actually start bringing in my colours of my plants. And here's where I'm going to get just what we call the local colour, the base colour, as in the colour that things are if they haven't got any other type of specific light shining on them. So for that, I'm going to go for a uh, greenish kind of colour and I think yeah that's quite a nice paintbrush to use. It's going to paint on this kind of green and I don't have to be too neat about it. I'm just going to try and paint on the rough area taken up by this leaf and as I do that I'm going to pick out all of the other green areas as well. And I'm pretty much leaving the, uh, the areas of the flowers to last. Uh, also, a little tip from a painting point of view, I would usually recommend 
leaving your favorite bit to last. Because if you don't do that, you're going to lose all motivation by the time you get to the end. I always find the part of the process I really like is painting details like eyes and hair and teeth and things like that that take a lot of intricate painting. And so I always have to be kind of disciplined and paint the other larger areas first so that you still got the energy to go in and kind of paint the other parts after that. Cool. So I'm just painting in the big sort of blocky areas of those flowers. And then I'm going to start painting in my actual orchid flowers. So I think we said sort of yellow, uh, maybe a little bit of red on there as well. And I'm just going to oh, I'll go a little bit lighter. Start picking out these areas of the petals. Now, as we do that, you can see at this point, I'm not doing much in the way of detail and shadows. I'm just putting in my, uh, my rough colors. And to be honest, I could leave it like this if I want to leave it fairly abstract. But I am going to go in and try and get a bit more detail going on now. I would recommend if you are trying to paint something really realistic, one thing that we said in the last session, if you're in the drawing session, was do make sure that you spend more time looking at your object than just looking at the screen, looking at the page. Because if you want it to be accurate, you're going to want to make sure that it actually looks like what you see in front of you. Now, because I'm sort of improvising a little bit and this yellow is definitely not something that appears in real life, I'm not looking so much to see if the color's right, but I am going to look and see, is this the way the shadows really hit my object? I'm going to make sure that I'm drawing this as accurately as possible. So now that I've got my, um, my uh, basic colors in, now I'm going to try and get involved with what we saw before, some of those um, shadow areas. And remember what we did last time, we got a bluish kind of color for where our shadows go. And I'm actually going to put them on their own layer here. And I'm just going to start painting in those areas of shadow. So this is going to be easy with things like the leaves here. If I want to paint in shadows around my leaves, I'll literally just choose the parts where that leaf kind of bends over. And I'm just going to add shadows to the darker areas like so. And because of the way my shadows work, you can see that already starts looking like that leaf is just folding over like so. Cool. Any more comments or questions coming in, guys? How, how's your, um, how's your yeah, painting? Somebody's asking what is the app that you're using at the moment, uh, Ashley. It's coming oh. actually from Pastor Clifford, starting with the <laughs> Smart Plan Director. Who... No worries, really, really good question. So the app that I'm using is an app called Procreate. It's an app that's a very good sort of painting app um, available on iPads. If you are uh, into painting with an iPad called Procreate, I think it costs about 10 pounds. Uh, it's not the only app you can use though, but it's uh, probably the one that I use the most um, when I'm actually um, drawing or painting on my iPad um, called Procreate. If you don't have it though, there's other apps. You've got an app called Notes that you can draw or paint in. There's a load of other apps, and not just on iPads and other tablets as well. Um, but yeah, I use Procreate. If you are painting, one thing that I used to use before I used my iPad so much is I used to use um, Photoshop, the actual Photoshop app on my computer. Um, but for now, I'm a big sort of Procreate fan. Cool. Any other questions at all, guys? All right, I'm, I'm looking. Uh... <coughs> Yeah, uh, a few more people asked the same question about app. Um, uh, what if you do not have a gift for drawing? Is it teachable or you have to have a gift, Ashley? Yes, that's a really good question. Guys. I um, absolutely 100% say it's teachable. Having a gift for it already can help. But it's if I'm honest, it's hard to distinguish what a gift really is because I 
you know, people might say I have a gift for drawing, but I'll be honest, I spend most of my life drawing. <laughs> so it's definitely a lot of practice that goes into it. And the more you practice, the more you'll improve. And there's also, now's a really good time to be learning anything like drawing because there's so many resources out there. There's so many online lessons. There's so many things you can kind of watch on YouTube. So I would say, yes, you know, if you already naturally find that you've got a gift for it and you're able to draw things that look really good or look really realistic, then definitely keep practicing to grow that. But even if you don't already, I'd say, you know, watch some of those online lessons. Uh, if I do make any, I will let you guys know as soon as possible, but definitely watch them and keep practicing. And um, I think the other thing is, you know, there's, there's some stuff that I naturally uh, find easy, but there's other stuff I don't. You guys might be able to see my guitar behind me. I went through the first 32 years of my life with no musical ability whatsoever. I couldn't even go near a piano without feeling like I was gonna break it. Uh, but then uh, pretty much last year, I just thought, why don't I just try learning a musical instrument? So for the last few months, I've been learning guitar. And it's interesting because I can now play songs and I never thought I'd get to that stage. So I'm a big, big believer that there's nothing that, you know, is so out of someone's reach that you can't actually start learning it if you start practicing. Um, cool. Okay, now I'm not because of time gonna keep going with this too long, but you guys can see where we're getting as we start putting in these shadows, it helps us to pick out some of these forms so you can see sort of the stem of the orchid and things as well. Um, the last thing I'll do in this demonstration, and if you guys are following along, please, please carry on after this. But the last thing I do in this demonstration is, as I said, actually start bringing in as well as my shadows, and because it's digital, I can just take off that layer and you can see the difference and add those shadows. Also add some highlights. So my highlights, same thing again, because the highlights tend to be lighter, I'm gonna actually bring in more of a yellow kind of color. And on the yellow flowers, this is gonna look very kind of bright. And you can see, this is where I'm really looking at my orchid. I'm looking at where the light is naturally shining through the petals there and just giving those edges especially a bit of a highlight here and also you can see these highlights on the leaves the leaves depending how those materials feel they'll be kind of waxy and they'll have this really high shine and gloss on the leaves like so and uh, yeah just picking up the edges of the leaves and the stems of those highlights can be a really powerful way of making your drawing look realistic. Now, I'm going to pause there because I know our time is uh, is nearly gone, and uh, I'm going to actually finish that off uh, after this. But hopefully, that gave a little idea of how you'd work with the still life object. So remember what we did first: we found our object, we set it up in a nice place with some lighting, drew the rough shape, the block colors and then we added some shadows and some highlights. This is the process that would be really good for you guys uh, to work with as you're going forward. Cool. The last ones we're not actually going to do but we're going to talk through and uh, these are the last things that I want you guys to do at home in your own time. So we looked at portraits a little bit, we looked at still life. We also want to touch on landscape. Like we said, a landscape is a scene, you know, not necessarily with people in it, but an environment. And one little thing, when you are thinking about landscape, and this is the activity that I'd love you guys to do, is to paint a landscape showing linear perspective. Now, one of the prerequisites for this course is having seen the other course. If you haven't yet, Dan, am I right in saying they're still on the Facebook page? So you can check out the drawing course and we go really deep into linear That's perspective. That's right. It is available on YouTube and we will, when we post this video on YouTube, we will link that one as well so people can have a look. But also actually, if it's possible, please do finish uh, uh, painting that uh, 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 and then send us. We would love to publish it yeah. so people can actually be inspired to continue drawing and painting. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll work on, see, I'm getting homework as well. I'll work on both of those drawings uh, and send them through. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a task that we'd love you to do is to actually paint a landscape. Now, some things to think about when you are painting a landscape is to think about the different parts. This can be a really helpful thing when you are painting a scene 
is think about breaking that landscape down into the three areas. What's in the background, what's in the middle ground, and what's in the foreground. And basically the background is the furthest thing away from you. And usually that might be the bigger areas like the sky, you know, buildings in the distance, mountains in the distance. The middle ground will be things that you can see, maybe a bit more of the detail. And the foreground will be things really close to you. And how you paint these, um, a lot of it is taking in what we already talked about. So remember when we were talking about colors, we talked about making shades and tints. And remember tints were mixing the color with white to make it a bit lighter. If you look at this, this is a very detailed landscape. I don't think I could ever paint a landscape like this. But when you look closely, you can see it's used that technique. They've been able to, where you look at the mountains, the mountains actually look like they're further away, like they're hazy. And that's crazy, because if you think about it, it's just painted on one piece of paper on one surface. But the way they've done that is they've mixed that blue color or gray color of the mountains with white and made it look a little bit more of a white tint. So those mountains look more hazy further away. The middle ground, they've sort of painted in, in good daylight, but they've added some shadow to the closer area, added some of those blacks to the closer area to make it stand out uh, even more. Now they could have done it the other way around. They could have made the, the foreground, the closest tower to us, they could have set that in sun and the background in shadow if they'd wanted to. Um, but obviously as an artist, you just try and paint what you, the scene you see in front of you. But remember those techniques. Remember objects that are further away, we're painting them a bit lighter, a bit hazier, and then we're getting more detailed as we get close. Does that make sense, guys? Any questions about that? Cool, I think hopefully that makes sense. Actually, no questions at the moment on that. Okay, uh, great. And then finally, um, I think everybody's busy drawing and painting. That's good. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> cool. Finally, two things. Uh, the last thing, this is the thing I think you might enjoy the most, because I'll be honest, I really like painting from photos. You know, the great thing about photos, they don't move. <laughs> so they're probably one of the easiest things to paint from. But I would love you guys, you can use just a phone for this or something, but take a photo of a friend or favorite pet. I'm gonna say you can do your family as well because I see a lot of patient pa uh, parents in the shots at the moment and I think they wouldn't mind being painted. So I think definitely if you've got a parent that stayed with you for this whole activity, I think they probably deserve a painting. Um, so I would love you to take a photo of that person um, and then paint from that photo, paint uh, painting of them. And you can use those techniques that we already talked about as well. Remember using the blues to show the shadows, the lighter colors in the yellows, um, or a pet, um, paint that from a photo. And that is some of your other homework. So the landscape and the portrait of a person or a pet. And the final thing, and we're gonna wrap up now, but there's one more thing I'd like you to do. This one hopefully is a bit easier, but I would like you to think about one of my favorite Bible verses, which is the verse Psalm 19, verse one. And this is a text. This is actually said by one of my favorite people in the Bible, which was David. David was an artist. He was more of a musical artist, um, but he did really appreciate the natural world around him. And what he said is, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. That's a really nice phrase. It basically lets us know that one of my favorite things about being an artist, being a painter, is that God is an artist as well. And David says that God is an artist. He's painted all the stars and his canvas is the sky itself. And one thing that we know is that God has made us in his image and God is our creator. Do you know what that means? It means he's creative. And so if you're creative too, that's just you being made in the image of God. And so I would love you guys to memorize this verse. It's not a long verse, but memorize it and think about what it means to you that God is an artist too. And that we are all, everyone here, everyone that's doing this honor, you are also artists. So you are made in God's image. And uh, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you guys. <laughs>